A reading from Psalm 119. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. We have a tradition in our family. Every May, Susan and I take the three kids and we go downstairs in our home into our storage room. And one at a time, we line up the kids against a door jam and we get out a marker and we measure how tall they are. And every year it's, it's a fun thing to do and we get to see uh, not just how much they've grown that year, but over all the years, because we have marked it, not just their height, but their ages. And we can see how, they, how tall they were five years ago, 10 years ago, you know, 15 years ago, since we've been living in our home. And it really is a marvel to see how much they've grown from just uh, little tiny people into um, oh, a couple of them now into adults. You know, when I think about that, you know, having the kids stand up against the door jam and being able to measure them, uh, it makes me wonder, how do we know if we are growing as Christians, as, as followers of Jesus? How do we know that we are maturing? How do we measure that? Well, I think the probably the most basic and simple answer is, is we, we know we're growing um, when we become more like Jesus. Uh, that's really the, the um, I think, the, the, the measurement, the ruler that we would use. That the more we're like Jesus in, in, in our lifestyle, in our attitudes, uh, in our motives, in our words, in our dreams, our ambitions... Um, uh, what we value, what we prioritize, what we invest in, uh, quality of our relationships, uh, our character. Um, you know, we think of fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all that. Um, the more uh, we, we reflect Jesus in all those things, uh, the more we are um, growing, the, the more those kind of uh, tick marks are, are climbing up the door jam. And, and they should. I mean, they, we should be growing in faith just as a, a child should be growing physically um, in, in their life. Now, my fear is this, and, and this comes out of being a, a pastor and being in ministry for, you know, 25 plus years, is that many people are not nearly as concerned about their spiritual growth as they should be, or they're not as concerned about their lack of spiritual growth as they should be. You know, if my wife and I went down the stairs and we marked one of our kids and we noticed they hadn't grown at all in the past year, uh, we would have been very concerned. We would have wanted to know, why is that? We would have taken them to the doctor because we know something is wrong. They're not growing as they should. No less if it was for two years, three years, five years, and they, they just weren't growing when they should have been. And I fear, again, that this is something that... Um, as Christians, we might kind of more take for granted. And we'll think of our spiritual growth like this. If, if it happens, that's great. It's a plus. It's a bonus. But it's not critical to our lives or our well-being uh, because I already believe in Jesus. I'm already going to heaven. Uh, I already have his, you know, his grace and his mercy on my side. Um, but, but the marks are staying kind of at the bottom of the door jam. 
And, and when that happens, I can tell you the results are really predictable uh, among Christians with stunted growth. Uh, there's just a general lack of knowledge uh, of God. Um, there is little to no confidence on how to share your faith. Uh, there's difficulty in answering questions about the Bible. Uh, there's difficulty in discerning moral issues and what is right and wrong, um, and, and also uh, courage to stand up for that. Uh, obvious character flaws that go unaddressed year after year after year. Uh, people who are easily set off track uh, by temptation, or people who are easily swayed by worldly opinions, um, people who have a constant doubt or uncertainty of God and who he is and, and what he is, is doing. You know, again, and, and we just can think of somebody who's been believing in Jesus for years, but the, their marks are still way down at the bottom of the door jam. Now, I'm going to say that none of us uh, want this to describe us, right? I mean, we're, you're watching this in the context of a worship service, so uh, obviously you have interest in, in the things of God, and um, probably most, uh, many of you, have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we want to grow in our, our relationship with Him. We want to be more spiritually mature. We want to be strong in our spirit. We want our our hearts to overflow with the things of God. We want to reflect Jesus in, in the things that we say and that we do. So the question becomes, how do you and I, how do we nurture that kind of growth? So we're just kind of moving up the door jam, you know, throughout our life. Well, let's think about it in physical terms first. How did my kids grow? What, what was the secret? What was the thing that Susan and I did that ensured that every year when we would go downstairs, the mark would be higher than the year before? Do you want to know our secret? Do you want to know what we did? We fed our kids. We fed them. That's it. We would feed them. Uh, we would give them good, nourishing food. And, and as a result of that, they grew. Now, you might be thinking, oh, but if only if, only if it was that easy growing spiritually, uh, if only it were that simple that we could eat this food and then we could just kind of grow naturally. Well, um, I'm here to say today it, it is that simple. Uh, it is that straightforward because God, in his great love for us, um, has given us food for the soul. God gives us food food for the soul to nurture us, to help us grow in faith. And that food is right here. It's your Bible. It is your Bible. The Bible is soul food. It feeds us, it nourishes us, and it makes us grow in faith and in character, in obedience, and in Christ-likeness. So what we're going to do today is look at a few verses from Psalm 119. Psalm 119, it is the longest chapter in the whole Bible, and it's all about God's Word. And what we'll do today is we're just going to highlight three aspects of the Bible, of engaging the Bible as food uh, to help us grow and mature in Christ. Now, the first aspect is going to deal with our relationship towards God's Word. And that word is love. The first aspect we're going to talk about is loving God's Word. Look at verse 97, what the psalmist writes. He says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate, it, I meditate on it all day long. And the word love here, it's it's the word of a, of a dear friend, of a great companion, or the love that one would have for their spouse or their child, one whom consumes their thoughts, just like the psalmist says. He goes, I think about it, I meditate it on all day long, just as someone who is in, in, in love, and they, they can't help but spend their whole day thinking about another. 
love also indicates, you know, pleasure and delight in something. Um, and we see this in Psalm 103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And um, earlier on, I asked you to uh, take out a little bit of honey, and we're going to do something with it now and something a little bit later. So just for right now, just, you know, take a little fingertip of honey and just put it in your mouth. And just kind of let it just taste it and just focus like the sweetness and the, um, the, the wonderful flavor that is. You know, when the psalmist was writing these words um, 2,000 years ago, there was no kill ones. There was no uh, sweet temptations. There was no refined sugar. Uh, there was no Hershey bars and, uh, you know, Reese's peanut butter cups and all the sweet treats that we like today. The sweetest and most delectable thing that uh, the psalmist had ever tasted in his whole life would have been this. This, uh, this sweet, delicious honey. And um, what he's writing here is that the word of God here was even sweeter to his soul than honey was to the mouth. And, and just the way that it would be just this delight that would bring a broad smile to someone who was eating honey. That was his uh, affection. That was his pleasure and delight in encountering God's law. And so he would, he would consume it. He would, he would take it in. He would feast on it. He would, he would eat this. Um, and, and we see uh, later in the New Testament, that's exactly what Jesus did. Uh, that is exactly what Jesus did. Jesus, who was the living Word of God, he loved the written Word of God. The Word of God was, um, it was just ingrained in who he was because he, he consumed it so much. You know, in the four Gospels, there's about 1,800 verses uh, where Jesus speaks or is, is giving some kind of instruction. Um, and about 180 of those verses are a direct quote from the Old Testament, or he's referencing a story or, a, you know, like an illusion of a word picture or something from the Old Testament. In other words, the words of Scripture were always part of his conversation. I mean, just think how many times does Jesus begin the conversation by saying, it is written, it has been said, you have heard it said. He's, he's constantly going back to God's Word. So uh, just off camera here, I've got a bucket of water. And in this, I have a sponge, and it's kind of been sitting in here for a while. And I think of this as like, this is like Christ. And, and, and the, the water is just the Word of God. And Jesus would just immerse himself in this. He would just love it. He would delight in it. He would feast on it. And you would see it's like, even like, it's, this is what would drip out of Jesus. It was always the Word of God. It would just drip out of him. And, and let's think of some moments where... Uh, Jesus was um, under great pressure where he was being squeezed by uh, the situation and circumstances where he's in the desert and he's being tempted by Satan. And what does Jesus do when he's being squeezed? He, he recites three different occasions, the words of Deuteronomy. And we see he, when Jesus is squeezed, the word of God pours out of him. When Jesus is on the cross, and the nails are in him, and he's suffering greatly. The words of Psalm 22, again, they just pour out of him. He is so filled with the word of God, the written word of God, that it just pours out of him. What just, I think, a, just a great and, and, and beautiful image uh, we have of, of Christ there. And so a question for you is, what comes out of you when you are squeezed, when, when life is bearing down on you and circumstances are difficult and trying, what comes out? Is it words of anger? Words of frustration? Is it, you know, salty, coarse language? Is it words of despair and hopelessness? Or when, when you are squeezed by life, is it that it's the word of God that comes out of you because you've been so consumed by it. You, you love it. You've delighted in it. You've been, you know, tasting it and 
filling yourself with it over and over again. So just take this time for a moment and think like, what is your relationship with the Bible? Is reading it a chore uh, or is it a privilege? Is doing a, a Bible study or a scripture study, is it like taking medicine? It's like, you know what's good for you, but it's kind of gross and unappealing. Or is it something like this that you just would consume with great delight? And is it something that uh, you can, you're fine with uh, having it occasionally? Or is it something that you just simply can't get enough of? And if we're going to grow in our faith, if we're going to see those marks go up the, the, the door jam, so to speak, if we're going to become like Jesus, we must love the Word as He did. We must love the Word the way our Savior loved the Word and filled Himself up with it. But engaging the Bible is more than just about loving God's Word. It's about knowing what it says. And that's our second piece. We've got loving God's word and knowing God's word. Because you can't grow to be godly in character if you don't know what God's character is like. You can't grow to uh, maturity in faith in Jesus Christ if you don't know a whole lot about him. Or you can't grow in, in right understanding of, of doctrine if you don't know what those doctrines say. Um, you can't know the Lord and follow in his ways if if you don't know what those are, right? And this is where scripture, uh, scripture here is our great, great help. Let's look at uh, verses 98 uh, on, and notice as we're reading through this on the screen, just the, the emphasis on the, the understanding, the knowledge that, of God that comes in scripture. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. Through your precepts, I get understanding. You know, knowing the Bible gives us understanding about who God is, what he has done, how he has ordered the universe, what you and I are supposed to do with our lives, how we can live in a right relationship with him, how you and I can respond to this invitation of grace he's offered to us in Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And that's why scripture is so important because there's no other way to access this knowledge. We, we're not born with it. We don't just come up with it on our own. The, the world isn't going to teach it to us. It's in Scripture, in Scripture alone, where we encounter God as He truly is. It is on the pages of Scripture that we meet with the Lord face to face and really encounter Him. It's between the covers of this Bible that we see the Lord striding across the pages of human history with authority and with power and with you know righteousness and with salvation. And it's here, right here in this book in front of us, where we hear his commandments, the loudest and the clearest, echoing from the ancient hills of Galilee and into our lives today. We can never, ever overestimate or overstate how important it is to have the right knowledge of God. 20th century uh, well-known evangelist, author, theologian, uh, A.W. Tozer makes uh, the case in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, that the right knowledge of God is the most important thing in life. Here's what he says. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion, and man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no real religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. So what Tozer is saying is this, that humanity 
uh, society, whatever we want to call it, will never rise above its religion. That will always be the limiting factor because it, it directs and dictates so much about our lives. But then he goes on to say that our religion will never exceed or be better than our idea of God. So that all of God, he says, our, all of life is really predicated upon our idea of who God is and what he is like. He goes on to say, for this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most important fact about any man is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. Now, you might think Tozer is, you know, overstating uh, his claim here. But truly, what you think about God determines everything else about you. It determines how you're going to live. It determines what you believe. Uh, it determines, you know, your, your attitudes, your approach, uh, everything. And, and what we're so, uh, the great gift we have in front of us is this um, word of God is absolute truth. And there is no limiting factor. Um, we have an infinite God who has given us this truth uh, of exactly who he is. And so we will never be limited by our religion, our idea of God, uh, if we turn to Scripture. And so we're going to need more than just a little taste, you know, like I was doing this before. We need more than just this little taste of it every now and then. We need to just feast on God's word. And what I see so many uh, people in the, you know, in the Christian world today, um, they're really content to just regurgitate a few well-known texts, um, or they'll just take a few verses out of context that uh, will help them, you know, feel better about God's plans or power in their life, uh, or they'll use it to try to, you know, win an argument. Um, that's, that's, that's not enough. You know, that's just a little morsel nugget. We really need to know uh, the whole story uh, of Scripture. Just as Jesus knew the whole story from beginning to end, his followers should too. We need to know the beauty and the drama of Genesis. We need to know the oppression and the freedom of Exodus, the sacrifice and the worship of Leviticus. We need to know the, the heartache of the prophet Hosea, the tears of Jeremiah, the, the glorious vision of Jesus painted by the prophet Isaiah, the, the conviction of God uh, shared through Malachi, the, the rich, deep theology of the gospel of John, the story of the spirit-saturated church recorded in the book of Acts. The letters of the Apostle Paul, which so brilliantly communicate to us doctrine and practice that is in accordance with the Lord. The glorious description of Jesus painted in the book of Hebrews and the apocalyptic drama of Revelation. See, knowing each part of the Bible. It, 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 it contributes to shaping and, and forming uh, our faith and, and in doing so, our lives. It gives us the ability to live wisely, to counter the lies of the world with the truth of God, calling on the, the whole counsel of, of God's wisdom shared in Scripture, not just a bit here and there. It allows us to effectively communicate the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to a world that desperately needs it so much. So here's my question for you. How wet is your sponge? How saturated is it? Uh, are you uh, just, you know, uh, at the point where you're just dripping God's word, you're just so filled with it uh, in your life, uh, the knowledge of God, or are you perhaps maybe like this other one, um, you know, I can squeeze it. Nothing's coming out. There's, there's enough moisture in here that it's not dry. I can move it a little bit, but there's nothing in here um, that's, that's going to come out. You know, um, 
there's no uh, you know water in here that's going to be you know shared or, or, or poured out it's it's kind of enough to keep it moist but that's about it so how how saturated is 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 you know your soul with in your mind and your heart with God's word you know there's over 31,000 verses in the scriptures how many do you know how many of you memorized and you could share right now out of 31,000 um, scriptures that you could share effectively and skillfully and in a timeful way that uh, you can, as Christ did, you know, and, and as so many other saints through the years have, you have a word from God for just the right situation in just the right way. You know, there's 66 books in the Bible. Um, how many of them, you know, you know what that book is about? You know what God is saying in it. You know what it says about the Lord, what it says about us, what we're to believe, what we're, what we're to do. How many of those 66 are you fluent in and again can share? Are you, um, you know, are you saturated and soaked in the word of God? Or are we more like this where there's, you know, we've got some wet spots on us, but um, there's nothing in here that I can, I can squeeze and push out. So not only are we to love God's word, I think that's just the starting point, and to know it, we really engage the Bible when we start to follow it, when we really start to follow it. And that's our third piece. We've got loving, knowing, and now the following piece. Let's again turn to Psalm 119. And this time I want you to focus on uh, how the psalmist uh, shares uh, not just the, the knowing of God's word, but the, the doing uh, the, the applying it to his life. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. You know, the, the psalmist, um, he really just didn't read the words um, you know, of, of God's law and, and or love them. He, he lived by them. And this is where we get to such an important part of engaging in, in our Bibles, because uh, all too often we engage in Bible study or scripture study as like an academic pursuit, and we just want to increase our knowledge. But the Bible is not given to us just for information. Ultimately, it is given to us for transformation. It's about applying what you know and, and putting it then into practice. So the love of God's word creates a, a hunger for knowledge, and then the knowledge of God leads us to implementing it into our life. We can see the progression there. And, and this is really where the, the rubber hits the road, is will we conform our minds in our behaviors to what scripture teaches us. And because we're all we're always going to bump into things in the Bible that challenge our beliefs and our behaviors. Think of a young Christian man who falls in love and uh, he's confronted then with um, this call to holiness and sexual purity amidst the rush of hormones in the world and a culture that says it's okay and it's it's great. Or think of a young Christian woman uh, who runs against, uh, runs into the call to uh, be modest in their dress and to be dignified uh, and to focus on inner beauty when everything the world says and so much of the impulse inside her um, is, is going in a completely different direction and says, no, 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 you need to be more, uh, more revealing, more, you know, um, uh, um, showing, uh, you know, your body off. Scripture teaches us, you know, uh, to forgive just as we've been forgiven in Jesus and, and to love our enemies, not whether we want to or not, not whether we feel like it or not, but we're just supposed to, to do it because we've been commanded. Scripture says, let nothing um, coarse or untrue or foul come out of our mouths. Scripture says, don't let anger uh, control you. Scripture says to give generously to the poor, even when we really want other things for ourselves. 
The scripture tells us that we are to make disciples of all nations, that we are to share our faith, we are to invest in relationships, we are to disciple uh, others around us. And it is only when we, we do these things, when we engage, when we allow scripture to really shape and mold our hearts, our minds, our beliefs, our behaviors, that um, we see the marks on the door really begin to go up. This is really where maturity happens. And I would say for a lot of people, this is the stumbling block. Uh, they may know a lot about the Bible, although I don't think uh, that's a, an epidemic we have in our, in our country right now. But there are plenty of people who know a, a good deal about, about the Bible, but, but it's the applying it piece is where it falls short. Now, with all this being said, I, I want to make it clear that in terms of spiritual growth and kind of becoming more like Jesus and those marks going up the door, there really is no other substitute for, for Scripture, um, for, for just engaging with the Bible. You know, we can sing songs, and we should, and it's good, and it's right, uh, and we can serve others um, and serve our church family and the community, and we should, and it's good, and it's right. Uh, but those are not substitutes for God's Word. Those do not provide the, the nourishment the Scripture does. They are not a soul food in the way that the Bible is. So I think the next step for all of us is really to, to commit to this regular feeding, feasting on this banquet uh, that God has prepared for us in our Bibles. And you can't snack on it just, you know, from, again, from time to time. You know, the reason our kids grew, as I said, we fed them. You know, we fed them multiple times a day for years, and we fed them, you know, nutritious food that would help them grow and vegetables and proteins and, you know, all that kind of stuff um, to make sure that they would grow because we knew that that was an important part of it. We had to feed them regularly, not just once a week, and we couldn't just give them, you know, anything. We had to be um, really consistent with that. And so uh, let us take the same approach with, with our scripture. And now there's all different kinds of ways to do this. There's just a, a tons of reading plans um, that are available. Most Bibles even have reading plans, you know, somewhere in them. There's a ton online um, that you can find. Um, scripture memorization, that is just a great way of taking scripture and really getting it in, in your word. Earlier in Psalm 119, the psalmist writes, I have hidden your word in my heart. It's like that idea of like he's just immersed himself in it. He's buried himself in it. And so um, doing a verse a week, um, trying to memorize a chapter, uh, a, a whole chapter or, or something is just, you know, a great practice. In, in immersing yourself in God's Word. Uh, and then just listening to it, you know, taking all these opportunities we have for to listen to audio scriptures, whether we're driving in the car or we're on a treadmill or exercise bike or on the lawnmower going around the yard, all these opportunities we have to, to really just saturate ourselves with the truth of God's Word. Now, we're going to be doing something as a whole church uh, starting in a month, and I'm so excited about it. Uh, we're going to be going through the whole Bible. Um, the, the, the big story of the Bible. And we're going to be going through it with a, a program or a curriculum called The Story. We had done it, if you can believe it, if you were around when we did it, it was 10 years ago when we did it. And we're going to be doing it again. And it's going to be an opportunity for us to really re-engage with the Bible so that we might love it, um, that we might uh, really know the truth of it, and that we would live it out daily in our lives. So there, you're going to be hearing a lot in the next month about the story, uh, but really today is just that kind of an introduction to, to really kind of whet our um, appetite for the truth of God's Word. So as we um, uh, kind of respond to this message, what I want to do is, is, is to kind of, kind of go back to the honey, and I want you to just take a, a, you know, a, a nice big finger full or whatever you have in front of you and to put it in your mouth and just to think of, again, how the sweetness of it and, and that God would make his word that sweet and that wonderful and is delicious to us.